The following program is the work of broadcast students from the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the past week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, Christy Clark apologizes for her party's ethnic voting strategy. The BC Conservative Party proposes their new five-year budget. And a former Canadian Olympic wrestler wins his NDP nomination. IT Magazine. I'm Connor Danoon. And I'm Christina Jung. Inarguably, it has been a rough two weeks for the BC Liberals. Christy Clark has apologized for what the media is calling ethnic gate. However, as Thorsten Gerlach found out, there are still Canadians who feel the issue goes beyond politics. She had done something immoral, she has done something insincere and she's not really suitable to be a leader. Bill Chu is one of many Canadians offended by the BC Liberals leaked ethnic strategy. Premier Christy Clark has apologized for the political gaffe, but Chu doesn't buy it. Her problem is really one of arrogance, one of uh, non-understanding, you know, the issues. Uh, she considers us to be some, some, a group that can be bought off just at the last minute, you know, quick win, as she described it. She was the chair for Canadians for Reconciliation Society, and he believes the ethnic strategy comes from a lack of understanding BC's multicultural history. Racism was never uh, uh, just about uh, respecting others' right to practice the culture. It's also about respecting others' right to their own history. The latest scandal has left the B.C. Liberals reeling and rocking and in full damage control. The controversy started after leaked documents revealed Clark's government wanted to curry favour from B.C.'s quote ethnic community by apologising for the Chinese head tax. Tekla Litt, the co-chair of B.C. Alpha, says this controversy goes way beyond politics. It's not just uh, disrespectful but actually it's an insult. Lip believes the apology isn't meaningful because the Liberals have not acknowledged history and made the apology for their own political gain. A government uh, should apologize for historical injustice because it is the right thing to do. Christy Clark held an emergency meeting this past weekend with her government in Victoria. And today she'll hold another meeting, this time with the full caucus. And she's also issued an apology to the multicultural community for the language that was used in the document. Thorsten Gerlach in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Joining us now is Thorsten Gerlach with more. Well, Thorsten, the scandal certainly has a lot of people well, talking. This issue has really divided the BC, the BC Liberals. Premier Christy Clark has had four high-profile defections from Surrey alone, where this issue has really uh, struck a chord. Now, uh, the harshest words came from the for now former Vice President of the Surrey Tynehead writing, James Flett. He wrote that uh, ethnic gate is one of the most appalling things he has ever read about his party doing and even went further by calling the whole issue as repugnant. Now the big news came earlier this week when multiculturalism minister John Yap resigned along with Deputy Chief of Staff Kim Hackstad who helped distribute the ethnic plan. Now Clark did lead her government through a crucial vote of confidence earlier this week and has pledged to remain on the job as long as it takes. Back to you Connor. Conservators are touting efficient government spending and steady taxes. As Thorsten Gerlach reports, they're promoting this in the five-year budget released earlier this week. The B.C. Conservatives released their five-year budget Tuesday, and killing the carbon tax was the hot topic. The carbon tax, essentially, it's unfair. Uh, it's unfair to people who need their car to have to jump in their car uh, to get to work because there's no public transportation. Uh, it's unfair to people in rural British Columbia who by, ne by necessity, need to drive bigger vehicles to cope with winter conditions and so on. The fiscal plan covers the current fiscal year up to 2017 and 18. Party leader John Cummins says his government would balance the budget without raising taxes and promised modest surpluses. He also said this is no pie-in-the-sky idea. Today, BC Conservatives are demonstrating to British Columbians that we intend to keep our commitments, all of them, 
Among other things in the Conservative budget, 7.5% of the GDP will go to health services, a lower number than that of the Liberals' budget, along with 55 to education and 1.6 to social services. Cummins said he would also keep a close watch on the legislature. We will establish a legislative budget office to provide MLAs with independent economic and fiscal analysis to help them examine government budgets and expenditures. What the Conservative Party calls smarter spending, which includes the elimination of the carbon tax, is what stood out most in this five-year budget plan. However, John Cummins wasn't saying what other priorities his party has or where else that money will go to. All he said is that we're going to have to wait and see. Thorsten Gerlach in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. And sticking with BC politics, former Canadian Olympic wrestler Chris Wilson has emerged as the NDP nominee for Coquitlam Burke Mountain. As Matt Lee reports, he's ready to throw his hat into a different kind of ring. Chris Wilson once made a career out of pinning his opponents. Now he's hoping to tackle some of the big issues in his Coquitlam community. And so, you know, you come across as professional when you hand somebody a color handout like this and you have, thankfully I was lucky to get all these people to, to endorse me. He's a former world champion, a Canadian national champion, and represented his country at the 92 Summer Olympics. He's even been in Sports Illustrated magazine. I got a call from Sports Illustrated um, early in 1992, and I was thinking, okay, well, is that just something on the phone I said, is this so-and-so from Sports Illustrated? I'm thinking, well, I thought my subscription was already renewed. <laughs> and I said, uh, he said, no, I'm calling about uh, an interview. What will I do? But Wilson wants to start a new career path in politics. He wants to be taken seriously not just because of his wrestling background, but because he believes he could serve the community well. I mean, I try to downplay my wrestling to some extent because I'm, I'm a lot more than just a wrestler, you know. Um, I, I think I, I'm a very effective uh, uh, community activist. I think I've been able to bring a lot of great programs to our city. Uh, there's no ignoring that there's bound to be some name recognition working in the NDP's favour. And with momentum already on their side, the NDP is hoping Wilson's star power will pay off. Recent history suggests that could be the case. Well, I think that this is sort of the inevitable thing that you see that happens when a party seems that it's on the fast track to power. You get a lot of people that suddenly become very interested in the party, people that might not otherwise be interested in politics, but see this as a good opportunity to sort of make a name for themselves. And With the election only two months away, Wilson is looking forward to preparing for the next biggest match of his life. Matt Lee in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. Well, the Bank of Canada has some good news for future homeowners, and they say they're becoming less concerned about household debt. The news will likely keep interest rates in place longer, spurring investment and economic growth. But even with the prospective good news, some in the lower mainland still believe housing is too expensive. Hi. So the house, you know, mostly for the families, no, is very hard because sometimes there's no have a job and not have nothing, and so it's very hard for people living in Vancouver because everything is very high. But if I buy one up there, I would get about 600 feet and it would cost me much more. For 800 feet, I would pay about 400. So it's a big, you know, it's a lot of money. The bank cites continued slack in the economy and the extremely low inflation rate as reasons for keeping the interest rate where it is. Some economists are wary, however, saying the outlook is a little too rosy. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, a Coquitlam resident says construction is threatening her home. A bear, a bear spray attack shocks customers at Oak Ridge Mall. This is me. And my mom and dad. And my big brother, Alex. And Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand. That jellyfish aren't made of jelly. That stars don't just come from the sky. That the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget I was sick.
this was my wish. Welcome back. Vancouver Mayor Gregor Robertson is once again calling for rapid transit to be built along the UBC and Broadway corridor. A study funded by the City of Vancouver and UBC suggests a subway line is needed below the Broadway area. Robertson says rapid transit would fuel growth at UBC and other employment hubs along the route. Most everyday transit users in the area agree. It seems more convenient than taking a bus, so many stops. If there's like traffic, then it messes off. I don't know how many people go to UBC in a day, but it would make sense to me to build a SkyTrain. To be honest, the 99 is a pretty good system already worked out. Like, we're traveling across UB, like across Vancouver. It's already pretty quick. For students, the average ride from Broadway SkyTrain to UBC takes 45 minutes. The Coquitlam Cape Horn is a stretch of Trans-Canada Highway between the Brunette Avenue and West End of Portman Bridge. And although this is good news to future commuters, as my fellow anchor found out, one Coquitlam resident says the constant construction is destroying her life. Here in this Coquitlam home, Farida Nanji says it's been at least two months since she's gotten a good night's sleep. All because of this. As you can see behind me is Nanji's backyard, and right next to her backyard fence is where the Cape Horn construction takes place. Starting at 10 o'clock in the evening, construction trucks roll over this area, which Nanji says causes unbearable noises and shakes to her home. Oh, the experience is dramatic, you know, like I haven't experienced something like this in my whole life. You know, when the house is shaking and the big lights and this noise, too, 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 and the other noise, my God, you know, ear deafening. Nanji says sleeping isn't the only thing she's losing. She feels her aging home is being damaged. <laughs> the creaking floors and construction noises have made her 94-year-old mother scared to be in her own home. This was my mother's room. This is the worst, you know. Because of her fright and when she comes out from the washroom, you see that little lobby. She says, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall. Then I hold her and bring her here or take her there. But you know, the stress that I'm falling, what's happening, these people will start again, you know, all that, she couldn't take it. Nandi says she's contacted the construction company many times, but has heard back from them only once. When contacted, Kiewit Construction provided the following statement. We have received Ms. Nandi's claim and completed an investigation which suggests the damage was unlikely caused by our work. This was out of the blue, everything, you know, unexpected. So I, I, I certainly expect compensation. Nanji has sent an engineer's report to Kiewit and is now waiting to hear back from them. Christina Jung in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. Customers in Oak Ridge Center's Apple Store were victimized by three men who stole a small number of electronics. The thieves used canisters of bear spray and as Matt Lee reports, this harmful substance is more accessible than most people think. For the second time in three months, bear spray has been the weapon of choice for criminals in the Lower Mainland who are committing an offense. Shortly before 7 o'clock last night, three men entered the Apple Store in Oak Ridge Mall and discharged a canister of bear spray. The men stole a, a small quantity of electronics before running out of the store and exiting the mall. There were about 40 customers in the store at the time of the incident. Five of them uh, were treated at the scene by paramedics for exposure to the bear spray. According to SFU criminology professor Robert Gordon, any attempt to regulate the harmful substance would be difficult. I mean, almost anything uh, can be used as a weapon. Any attempt to regulate the sale uh, of bear spray any more than it's currently the case is bound to fail. The accessibility of bear spray in the Lower Mainland varies. Major retailers such as Mountain Equipment Co-op carry it on their website. However, they require photo ID upon purchase and ask that customers sign a waiver form before completing the sale. On the other hand, Canadian Tire's website advertises bear spray and there's no mention of a photo ID or waiver form being necessary. Sporting goods store owner Paul Sylvester no longer carries bear spray. Uh, number one, not a lot of call for it, but also the risk of the wrong people would buy it. You know, it's not all that effective against the bear because you're going to be able to wait until it's close enough. BPD are reminding the public that carrying the potentially harmful substance on the streets is illegal 
and anyone found in possession of it could be criminally charged. Uh, it is considered a weapon when using it uh, for this, this type of, of incident, so there's no lesser or more degree depending on the type of weapon, whether it's a, a bear spray, baseball bat, knife, or whatever the case is, it's still a weapon. Matt Lee in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Three suspected car thieves were arrested by police across the Lower Mainland in the first weekend of March. The arrests represent a large drop in car thefts over the past decade. And as my co-anchor tells us, better technology and policing can take credit for the roughly 80% drop in stolen cars. Ten years ago, almost 20 cars were reported stolen every day in Vancouver. Now, that number has dropped to three. Vancouver police attribute better policing tactics and technology, preventing would-be car thieves from acting out. The public being educated on, on how to prevent their car from being stolen, it's technology, some of the newer cars now, uh, um, it's more difficult to steal them. There's still lots of older cars out there though. Uh, we've put into, into place a lot of programs to prevent cars from being stolen in, in Vancouver. That includes our, our bait car program. Police say it's not necessarily the cars thieves are after, but the fact that they provide a means of transportation for further criminal activity. Most of the vehicles on the most stolen cars list have been built in the late 1990s or earlier. And the top three include the Honda Civic, the Honda Accord, and the Ford F-Series pickup trucks. Here at Kingsway Honda, salesmen explain how hot wiring cars are a thing of the past and outline current anti-theft technologies in their vehicles. Um, Anti-theft immobilization system on all the Honda's vehicles and what it does is basically there is a microchip inside the key and there's no way you can actually start the car without using the exact key. So all the keys are pretty much programmed to each car and each owner and what it does is you cannot even make a copy of the key itself. You have to go to a specific Honda dealership um, for you to be able to get the copy of the vehicle and you have to show that you are the registered owner of the, the vehicle. Ms. Lang says all new Honda cars come with various alarm options to further deter thieves. Connor Danoon in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Well, almost a thousand new residents are moving to Surrey every month and housing is a high priority. The city is working to accommodate the growing population, but as Sana Ranguela reports, several Surrey homes contain illegal rental suites. These are some of Surrey's many houses with basement suites that provide a place for new arrivals to stay. But a lot of these houses aren't permitted to have a secondary suite. We appraise a house that has a basement in Surrey. Um, the majority of the time, there is always an unauthorized suite in that house. In fact, Walker says he comes across nearly a thousand unauthorized suites a year. On learning that number, homeowner John Borsma says he thinks it's unfair some people benefit from renting their suites illegally. They earn money and they don't do it legally, right? It's illegal, right? So if you do it properly, it, it costs you more money. And and that's all that really bothers me, right? More money indeed. It can cost between five to ten thousand extra dollars to lawfully outfit a secondary suite. Additionally, getting a legal permit can cost up to six hundred dollars a year. And the cost of utilities are a whole other story. Well, this is a water sewer bill. And every house is basically per unit. It works out to be about eight hundred dollars a year for water, sewer, and garbage. And uh, if you have suites, like a, for instance a fourplex, then you got four of them, so it's 800 times four. So how much does Borsma pay in property taxes a year? $3,200 a year. Surrey City Councillor Burinda Rizzotti says the city is doing its bit to crack down on illegal suites. We've uh, made sure that bylaw officers go through the papers to see people who are uh, advertising their suites to double check if they've had an opportunity to come register them and if they haven't we just fire off a letter reminding them that that is uh, something that we expect them to do. Since July 2012, the city has ordered 180 rental suites to shut down. Sana Rangwala in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, recycling could get complicated in the city of Burnaby. My musical guest Dominique Rico joins us for a live performance. They say if you want a wish to come true, never tell anyone. But there is one wish that can make the difference between life and death. And this wish can only come true if you tell someone. 
please let your family know you want to be an organ donor. Standby graphics, ready, camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT Magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Welcome back. In just a few months, Burnaby residents may see a change in their recycling program. Glass bottles may no longer be accepted, but as I found out, not everyone is happy with this proposal. People come here to recycle cardboard, paper, and other recyclable materials. But soon, this will be the only place people can recycle glass. This as a result of a proposal by the BC Ministry of Environment. In a report, the ministry states materials like glass contaminate other recyclable items and therefore should be removed from the curbside collection program. However, some city councillors don't agree with this change. I think it's a step backwards. I think that, you know, as I said, anything that we can do to make it more convenient and easier for people to recycle is going to help us get to our target of recycling everything. In fact, Councillor Jordan feels this move may deter people from recycling glass altogether. You're not recycling something that could be recycled. The risk is it will end up in the garbage and never, never be recycled. Burnaby Council have requested an extension in order to receive feedback from the community on this issue. If the proposed plan passes, homeowners will have to collect their own glass jars and come here to recycle them. <coughs> Christina Jung in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Joining us live is singer-songwriter Dominique Frico. Thanks for joining us today, Dominique. So tell us, how did you get started in the music industry? Uh, I basically always kind of just wrote songs when I was a teenager. And uh, when I went to university, I did about three years of history before I realized that I ultimately just wanted to be a musician. So I started playing in bands, and here I am today as a solo artist. Wow. T tell us, what continues to inspire you to stay in the career? I think just uh, the people that I've decided to work with and a lot of the musicians I play with are pretty inspiring people and uh, every, uh, yeah, every show I play I, I meet new people and find new fans and it's just what I love doing and that's, that's what I can why I keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the projects and upcoming uh, music releases that we can look forward to? Uh, I'll be out, uh, out, out east for Canadian Music Week at the end of this month in March uh, and then I'm actually touring Western Canada with an artist named J.P. Ho uh, at the end of April. Well, we'll look forward to that. Well, that's all the time we have for you today, mm -hmm. but thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing you play right after this week's Community Calendar. Hi, I'm Janella Hamilton, and this is your Community Calendar. Healthy eating is an important part of any healthy lifestyle, so make sure you visit this year's 14th Annual Healthy Chef Competition taking place March 13th at the Hyatt Regency, Vancouver. Tickets are $90. For more information, visit www.bcpma.com. After consuming all those healthy meals, dance your way down to Vancouver's Celtic Fest here at the Village in Falls Creek. It all kicks off Saturday, March 9th until March 17th. While some events are ticketed, many are free of charge, so make sure you check out www.CelticFestVancouver.com for more information. If your feet are tired from all that dancing, hop into your custom car and drive your way down to the Vancouver International Auto Show at the Vancouver Convention Centre. To purchase tickets, visit www.VancouverInternationalAutoShow.com. I'm Janella Hamilton, and that's your community calendar. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcastnews.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Connor Denoon. And I'm Christina Jung. That's your news for BCIT Magazine. Up next is Dominique Rico Live.
port of Camby in 16. Cross 